Hey guys, we're going to do homework for stats 7.3. So this is where the section starts, and I'm just going to put in the video the multiple choice 87 to 90. So let's take a look. Using our notes, let's see if this falls in line with these questions help us deepen our learning. So it says the distribution of scores for the mathematical SAT exam in recent years was approximately normal. Okay, so shape. This is like what we did in our lesson, right? Mean and standard deviation or variance. Now this is our population data, right? Now it says imagine we choose a simple random sample of 100 students who took the exam. What would be the mean and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution? So that would be this which we know is equal to that, which we know is that. Just, it stays the same. And what would be the standard deviation? Well, we established that the standard deviation of my sampling distribution would be my standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So that would be one, one, four divided by the square root of four, because it says my or the square root of 100, what am I saying? There you go. Because my sample size is 100, and I didn't even have to put it in the calculator, there's my answer, B. Nice. So number 88, why is it important to check the 10% condition before calculating probabilities involving X bar? And I'd also like to point out, this was also important when I was calculating probabilities with P hat. So what is a 10% condition and why do we use it? So let's take a look. Do we use it to reduce the variability of the sampling distribution? And that would be no. Um, remember in our notes, we're saying we increase sample size to, to reduce the variability, right? That's from our notes. Right? I'm looking for the notes where it said that, but it looks like I closed that document. Um, this showed up on our 6-1 quiz as well, do you remember? And now it says, well, um, do we do the 10% to ensure that the distribution of X is approximately normal? And that extra is no. Like when we take um, quantitative samples like X bars, right? then to ensure it's going to be approximately normal, we're going to have to follow the central limit theorem, which states that we are certain that the distribution of the sampling distribution would be approximately normal if n is greater than or equal to 30. So that doesn't have to do with my 10% rule. Eh. What about, do we do the 10% condition to ensure that we can generalize results to a larger population? And that's also going to be a big no. Um, for instance, we take samples. Let's say, let's say I want to make an inference about, to generalize about the population of juniors. So in order to be able to generalize, about a large population of juniors, I need to make sure that I'm taking a sample of juniors, not anything else. So whatever my sample consists of, that is the only group of population I can make an inference about. So again, I just wrote down an example. To ensure that we can generalize the results to a larger population, we make sure we take samples of juniors to make generalizations about large populations of juniors. I have to pick the same thing. Let's look at D. To, in order to, we do the 10% condition to ensure it's an unbiased estimator. And that doesn't really apply. Um, because again, an unbiased estimator would have to do with a number of factors. Um, okay, so last, it, that must mean our answer is E, so let's figure out why. 
to ensure that the observations in the sample are close to independent. Yes. This is it, but why? Well, remember we started the chapter with bins, and this 10% uh, condition only worked if we were picking samples, and the proportion or the probability of that has to remain the same. And that means it has to be independent. Well, in order for it to remain the same and be independent between samples, then you have to have replacement for these to be independent. So again, I don't always, or I can't always guarantee replacement. So is there kind of a workaround? And the answer is yes, that's my 10% condition. As long as I'm pulling from a large enough population, um, when I take 10% of that, then my sample must stay less than or equal to 10% of my larger population. And that way it won't matter if I replace this sample of juniors from my population of juniors, as long as I'm pulling a small enough group of juniors from the pool, from the large pool of juniors I'm interested in making an inference about. Okay. 89, a machine is designated 16 ounce to fill 16 ounce bottles. When it's working populated, properly, it has a normal distribution with a mean of 16.05 and a standard deviation of 0.1. Now this is my population distribution, right? Now it says, assume the machine is working properly, okay? And let's assume we took four bottles. So that's a sample size of four. So kind of the activity we did today, imagine dropping out of the sky four bottles, right? And if we selected a sample of just those four bottles, then they're saying there's a 95% probability that the sample mean, so that's what drops down here in our blue box, was the average of those samples. And that's what we're exactly what we're talking about here in this question. What is the probability that the sample mean will fall within one of these intervals? Okay, really cool question. So we know that this will be having the same center, right? Just like uh, question number 87 down here, the mean stayed the same. But my standard deviation changed because this is a graph of my sampling distribution. Okay, so looking at the graph, my mean is the same, but my sampling distribution is that. So let's go ahead and calculate that. 0.1 over the square root of 4 would be 2. 0.1 over 2. So my sampling standard deviation would be 0 0.05. Okay, so now this is actually a empirical rule question. We know that the empirical rule states that 68, 95, 99.7 that one standard deviation to the left and the right is 68% of the information. Two standard deviations to the left and the right could be expected for 95. So they're essentially saying, what would be the location of two, two standard deviations to the left and two standard deviations to the right? So when we made our little flappy thing in class way back when, we just kind of calculated these manually. So 16.05 and I want two standard deviations to the right, so I'm gonna add 0.05 twice, plus one standard deviation, plus another standard deviation. There it is. And then how do I find the location of two standard deviations to the left? I simply subtract one standard deviation, and then one more subtraction of standard deviation to figure out where would two standard deviations to the left be. And we find our answer. Nice. All right, last one, question number 90. It says, 
The number of hours a light bulb burns before failing varies bulb to bulb. So we know that many things have a high level of variability. The population distribution of burnout times is strongly skewed right. So this is similar to the data we collected today, right? Our data skews right. This is actually not a picture of my raw data. That's actually an N of two. My raw data looked something like pretty skewed, right? My population data. So it says, if it's strongly skewed right, what does our central limit theorem tell us? So our central limit theorem states that even though the population distribution is skewed right, the sampling distribution at around 25, the closer we get to 30, it will be approximately normal. We also notice that when it was small, like only a sample of two, that a skewed right population data would give us um, skewed right sampling data as well, just a little less skewed. So let's see how that would play into a multiple choice question. It says, as we look at more and more bulbs, the average burnout gets closer to the mean for all bulb types. I'm not sure that's what we're trying to address. We're trying to address this skewed right business, right? All right, the next one says, the average burnout time of a large number of bulls has a sampling distribution with the same shape, strongly skewed, as our population. That would be true, but I don't like this word large. This would be true if this was a small number of samples. All right, so let's go to C. The average burnout time of a large number of bulbs has a sampling distribution with a similar shape, but not as an extreme. This would be too, true, but again, this would be better if they said smaller and medium number, like we noticed. The, so let's look at D. The average burnout time of a large number of bulbs has a sampling distribution that's close to normal. Interesting, I don't really like close to normal. And then the last one says the average exact, we never say exactly normal, I'm not gonna fall for that. Okay, so let's look back over. We do know from our notes that a large, I would have liked, I guess they're using the word close to is to mean approximate, that the average burnout time of a large number of bulbs, again, going back to our notes, even though the population distribution is screened right, the sampling distribution of large, and we're going to define large as 30, we know that a large would look approximately normal or at close to normal, and we're going to pick D. So what's wrong with C? Again, we fixed it. It's going to have to say small or medium would still slightly be skewed. So that's why we picked D, because they said large, and we know if it's large, it will be approximately normal because of the central limit theorem. Thanks for joining us.